Good evening, everyone, and welcome to today's final webinar in this four-part series called People and Place, hosted by the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. My name is Diane Chalfant, and I'm a volunteer and board member of the Yellowstone Gateway Museum here in Livingston, Montana. You know, our museum is a tremendous resource for the community, and so much of it can be accessed online like this webinar series. But beyond the webinar programs, the museum also offers just a fascinating digital photo archives. And I'm sure that many of the images you'll see tonight came from those archives. Also online exhibits and research services. So if you're not currently a member, we really encourage you to become a member and explore more about the natural and cultural heritage of Park County, Montana. Uh, in a moment, I'll introduce the museum's curator, Karen Reinhardt. But first, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so that you'll know how to participate in today's event. Now, at any time during the webinar, you'll have a chance to ask questions of our speaker, Paul Shea. And the way to do that is to go to the bottom of your screen there where you see the Q&A and just type in your question. What we'll do is, oh, by the way, the questions are anonymous, but what we'll do is we'll read the questions and throughout the program, we'll offer them to Paul so that he may answer them during the program. And if we get a lot of questions, we may just hold some until the end. So please remember, you can ask Paul questions throughout and we'll go ahead and present those to him. Um, we will be recording this webinar and we'll upload it to Yellowstone Gateway Museum's YouTube channel, which is great because you can watch the program again later or you can invite your friends and family to watch it um, on the YouTube channel after the event. And then finally, following the webinar, we will offer a very short survey and we hope that you'll consider um, taking that survey because it'll help us to improve programs in the future, especially these programs that we're doing online. So we hope that you will take the survey. Um, now I'd like to introduce Yellowstone Gateway Museum's curator, Karen Reinhardt. Karen? Thank you, Diane. And thank you so much for all of your work in the programs. This is the final People in Place speaker series webinar, but I wanted to announce that we do have another webinar coming up Thursday, May 13th. And this is uh, to kind of wrap up the webinar series that we did last fall, which was entitled Montana's Native People, Perspectives on the Clovis Child. So this is a speaker's panel. We've asked um, many of the speakers who presented at that time to join a panel. This will give you an opportunity to ask questions of science and humanities professionals who worked at, at or on the ANZIC site, which is a 12,600 year old burial site in Northern Park County. So please consider joining us for that program on May 13th. But tonight, Paul Shea illustrates the area's early history with historic photos from the museum's collection, tracing the beginnings and the development of Livingston in Park County. But rather than reveal the scope of his program, I'll let him tell you more about what has shaped our area. But a bit about Paul. Paul served as director of the Yellowstone Gateway Museum from December 2009 to April 2020. Before he moved to Livingston, he was the founding executive director of the Yellowstone Historic Center in West Yellowstone, a position that he held from 1998 to 2008. Paul also oversaw the restoration of West Yellowstone's historic railroad district, and he, he has lived and worked in and around Yellowstone National Park since 1979 and is originally from Nevada. Now sit back, relax, and enjoy Montana history. Please welcome Paul Shea. Thank you, Karen and Diane. I'm gonna go ahead and pull my program up here and get it set up. Okay, let's get going here. There we go. Okay. <clears throat> well, I'm happy to be here this evening. I always like to talk, so this is a good opportunity for that. And uh, I'm going to be uh, talking about the early development of the county um, and um, it's not going to be so much, it, well, it's going to be chronological, but it's going to be more um, thematic as I go along. I'm gonna talk about some different aspects of early development. So I'm gonna kind of jump back and forth um, chronologically in our early development. I'm gonna be talking about the railroad, the mining, tourism, Yellowstone National Park, hot springs and so forth. Uh, not necessarily in that order, 
and once again, we'll move back and forth. There's uh, a lot to uh, talk about. Any one of these subjects, you could do a complete program on. So it's not going to be really, really heavily in depth, but we'll, you'll get a really good idea of the development here. First off, I'd like to start with uh, Port Parker. And the reason I start with this is this was the Crow Agency. Uh, begun in 1868, it was there until 1875. I wanna talk about the Native Americans just briefly. They're not part of this program. They would be a whole nother program on their own. They have been here for about 12,600 years as Karen mentioned earlier from the Anzac child burial up until, uh, up until uh, just more recently. So, uh, you know, not to cut them out of this because you know their history is very important to this area on its own. It stands alone on itself. But we're going to focus on the European development, we could say, of, of what's going on. But Fort Parker, this was a photograph taken by William Henry Jackson uh, in the, uh, I think that should work, in the uh, 1871 when he was out with the Hayden surveys who were uh, came through Montana on the way to the Yellowstone region uh, to do surveys there. So uh, this is where I'm going to start. So next, early development. Uh, this is uh, Hunter's Hot Springs. Uh, this photo was actually taken in 1882, but the first buildings in use, this building here, this is a stereograph. This building here, you can see my pointer, this is the original house. It's now in 1882 serving as a post office. It was built in 1870. So from 1870, they started using Hunter's Hot Springs. Uh, people started coming there. Of course, the Native Americans once again had used it for thousands of years. So one of the really early <clears throat> economic developments uh, other than Fort Parker, which of course brought business, is Hunter's Hot Springs. And this is located on the Convict Grade Road between Livingston and Springdale, actually only about two miles from Springdale on the east end of that road. We'll talk more about this later, but uh, a really early uh, look at commercialization and the development of commerce here in, in uh, Park County, what was to be Park County. Of course, it was the coming of the railroad that really opened things up. Uh, this photo taken, uh, in 1882 as well. These photos by E.F. Everett. I should mention a photographer out of Mankato, Minnesota who traveled out west and through Montana, the Dakotas in Montana in 1883 or 1882 and early 1883. <clears throat> Took some incredible photos. This photo and the next one of the railroad are two of the only known photos of construction of the railroad in this area. For those of you, <clears throat> excuse me, familiar with the road between uh, Livingston and Bozeman. This is down in the canyon. You recognize the big rock formation up there to the left. These areas up in here we see. The freeway goes through here today. But uh, these are actually, they're, they're building the roadbed here. And the railroad was going to have a huge impact, you know, transcontinentally on the whole nation. And then we'll focus on what it really did in Park County, like elsewhere. Railroads were life-changing events when they arrived, especially when you're on a major railroad like Livingston was. Here's another photograph taken, <clears throat> actually showing track being laid down. And I like to point out in this, if you look at this track down here and the, uh, the ties, this is really rough. <clears throat> this is really rough work. And this was common of the first big transcontinental railroads when they put them down. Uh, because they were getting paid mileage. They got land grants and so forth, but they got paid miles per track laid. So the faster they could lay track down, the, the more, the quicker they'd get money from the federal government. So they just threw these tracks down. <clears throat> when the uh, line was completed, they immediately start rebuilding, almost immediately, and have to go through and rebuild the whole track, the beds, the rails, and so forth. You look at this, these rails aren't even lined up on these ties here. It kept them down to a speed of about 25 miles an hour at the most, which was still a considerable amount of speed for those days. But uh, once again, this is going to change a lot of things, and especially in what at this point is Gallatin County, uh, 
Gallatin County had been had been founded earlier. We were part of Gallatin County up until 1887, but the coming of the railroad was going to really uh, change that, especially with the uh, the development of Livingston. <coughs> Here's the celebration arch at Livingston. This is for the completion of the Northern Pacific Railroad on September 8, 1883. So they were celebrating uh, the thing, and you see this Livingston, the hub of the NPRR. So Livingston's going to be a hub. It's going to be a central piece. Your hub is a central piece of a wheel. Livingston is <clears throat> just approximately halfway between uh, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Tacoma, where the railroad was heading. So it was a convenient spot <clears throat> to build the shops, which we'll talk more about. And also, because it's at the bottom of a, a major mountain pass, they have to stop here to put on pusher engines. But uh, a really early photograph taken. Uh, so we're going to talk about Livingston. <coughs> Livingston itself gets its beginnings in late 1882. We date it more recently here, uh, 1883. That's because that's when the train got here. But actually, there was a post office in Livingston in uh, late 1882. And in historical looks, post offices are generally what you get that gives the town its beginnings. But over the years, the date 1883 has been so ingrained, I think it would be, it would be pretty hard to, uh, to, uh, to, to change that date at this point, but 1882. And this photo, once again, by E.F. Everett, taken in October of 1882. And you see he listed as Livingston, Montana. <clears throat> we know this development is Clark City. Excuse me, I gotta get some water, my throat is. <clears throat> clogging up tonight. But this is uh, what you hear of as Clark City. For those of you who've been around Livingston for a long time, you're familiar with that. If you're new, you might hear people refer to the original town site as Clark City. And uh, this photo was taken 1882. It is the earliest photo of Livingston that we know in existence that we have. This came to us uh, just several years ago. And what you're doing is you're looking down through Clark City. And in the background here, this is Sheep Mountain back here. For those of you familiar with Sheep Mountain, just east of town. So the Yellowstone River is just on the backside of these buildings here. And this would have developed out in kind of a, a ramshackle way. Now, here's another photo that was taken. This is either late 1882 or 1883, Clark City. <clears throat> and you can see, a lot of wooden shacks, a lot of uh, a lot of uh, log cabin construction, and it wound along, as I said, down along the river, uh, pretty much. And we'll have a picture. I'll show you where where it was located in relation to the town, but pretty much along the route of what is Clark Street today. Although Clark Street was straightened out to uh, conform to the development, uh, the Riverside uh, addition when they put that in, but uh, this is early now. Clark City didn't exist until August, about August or September of 1882. Uh, prior to that, there had been a lot of people living at Benson's Landing. Benson's Landing is about three miles east of town out where Calvary, the cemetery, the Catholic cemetery on the Old Clyde Park Road. That was the uh, ferry, the landing that went across to give access to Fort Parker. And in <clears throat> August of 82, uh, the railroad let it be known where they were going to uh, plat out their new city, Livingston, and the in the depot. And so, oh, just overnight, Benson's Landing just disappears, and everybody moves up to the Yellowstone River, this area we call Clark City. And they're going to sit here until early '83, and then they're going to start moving up closer to the railroad. This was a game the railroads played. You, if you read about transcontinental railroad development, the UP earlier and, and the NP trying to figure out where the railroad were going to put their depots in their main stopping places so you could get as close as possible to try to get some of the good property uh, located. <clears throat> this, these guys were a little out of the way. They have to move completely. But these two photos really early showing uh, some of the people coming in here. <clears throat> this is spring of 1883. Uh, taken off the north side hill, this photo is by F.J. Haynes. He was a well-known Yellowstone National Park photographer. He was also a photographer for the Northern Pacific Railroad. 
And so he takes a lot of photographs of this area. And this is the earliest photograph we have off the North Side Hill. And uh, I joke, I could probably do a whole program on Livingston just from photographs taken off the North Side Hill. But this is early 83, uh, earlier than June, I know because there's some buildings missing that show up. This is the first depot, the first railroad depot. And it sits on the uh, east side of the tracks where, the, where the, our depot sits today. And this street here would be Third Street. This was pretty far down. We're looking straight down Second Street now. So today's depot sits right in here. We'll see a picture of it in a little bit. And then this is Main Street over here. So we're seeing, and there's just a single track going through here at this point. But they built this depot really early. And you can see it's a pretty sizable depot. Uh, so they were getting ready because they were already promoting Yellowstone National Park. And the line was actually being built south toward Yellowstone National Park at this point. So this is uh, a really early development, but notice all these buildings, people are building up in here really quick. This wasn't here until those other two photos, Clark City photos were taken actually way back over here. But people immediately started moving up. This is the Brunswick Hotel, one of the first hotels in town. And it immediately, other hotels start springing up uh, by the end of 1883. So really early picture. This picture <clears throat> taken probably in September of 1883. Once again, off the North Side Hill. There's the depot sitting here. A look at Park Street is filling up. There's the Brunswick Hotel. We're looking down here, actually construction's going on for the, uh, I think it's the First National Park Bank, which is now the Masonic Building. And then uh, these buildings, Wetstein's Liquor, which was here in July, opened in July. And then down here, this big white building is the Merchant's Hotel, which was a real popular hotel we hear a lot about. <clears throat> but looking back here along the tree line, this is Clark City, all back in this area, back in here. So all those people from Benson's Landing had moved up here throwing up shacks, tents, and so forth. And now they're moving into the downtown area. Look, this has developed out quite a bit, even since early uh, 83, that F.J. Haynes photo. So things started happening really fast here. The other thing you'll notice about these early photos is there's some substantial buildings going on here. Uh, <clears throat> this one over here as well. Livingston wasn't like a lot of Western towns. Most Western towns have their beginnings in mining and then agriculture and so forth if you're close to a river. Uh, we're gonna talk more about both of those issues as we talk, but Livingston had the railroad. And by 1883, now this is September, the Livingston Enterprise started publishing in June of 1883. And they're already talking about the railroad, actually in late 1883, about this time the railroad says, within a year or two, we are going to have a thousand jobs at Livingston. That's a huge amount of jobs for a small community, especially a brand new community such as Livingston. I'm gonna sneeze it, try not to. <laughs> In the research room, I'm allergic to research. Uh, so here's a later photo, 1888, and things have really boomed. Uh, this is the Albemarle Hotel, big, huge international hotel that went up. We see the bank building, here's Westine's Liquor, Oops, this building here. Um, this is the Merchants Hotel I pointed out earlier. These buildings, these three buildings here were built in 1883 and early 1884. This one here was GW Carver. This is the site of the Livingston Bar and Grill today. Uh, and then this building over here is gone. The front part of it burned down in the 1980s. But this is where Glenn's Bar and Grill in the back is located here. Just to give you kind of an idea. So this is Main Street, looking up here. This is 2nd Street. So they really moved the depot pretty far down in between 2nd uh, and Main Street. This is the second depot <clears throat> built. The first one burnt down in late 1888, and they immediately put up this building. One of the interesting things is they've moved the depot across the railroad tracks. So the railroad tracks are actually between the depot and town. And that creates problems when you have a lot of passengers. They're getting off, they're crossing railroad tracks. If you got trains coming through, uh, and this is a uh, transcontinental line, main line, so you're gonna have problems there. 
But to, to show you just the development really early, this is five years worth of development. All of this is being developed out. And this big building over here, I believe this was a roller skating rink. One of the first ones they really, roller skating was big in America at that time. Livingston had two big roller skating rinks and you read the newspapers, they would bring in roller skating teams from around the country would come through. just like almost your variety shows and they would do you know, programs and you could go out and you could race the guys to see if you were, you were as fast as, the, as those racers. And then throughout the week, they would have dances and uh, chaperone dances and so forth. Uh, didn't realize how important roller skating was in the American West and early development of recreation. And Livingston Peak here in the background, a good picture of that, looking at that. And then also notice though that Clark City is mostly all gone. There's a few buildings still left down in here. Everybody's moving up into the, into the town area. So in, with this increase with the railroad, which we'll talk about more, the, the railroad jobs, the building of the railroad, uh, Livingston was a very uh, aggressive town and very well-to-do. This was the Park County Courthouse built in 1896. And in the background here, this is the East, the original East Side School. It was rebuilt in 1922, the school that is undergoing renovations today, the Shane Theater. But this was their, their big showpiece, Park County. Now, a lot of reasons for the creation of the county. Now, we were up until 1887, this was Gallatin County. And what had happened is Livingston had grown so fast in those five years uh, with the railroad, the increase in agriculture because of the railroad uh, and the mining, which we'll talk about. Uh, a lot of revenue, a lot of tax revenue going over the hill to Bozeman. No one ever likes to send their money away. And also the courts. If you had a court case, you had to go to Bozeman to go to the courts. All your district courts, your county courts and so forth were in Bozeman. So Livingston petitioned and uh, they split the county off, created Park County in, in uh, 1887. And the reason for that, once again, is just it's rapid growth and expansion, uh, which is really due to the railroad. So we're going to head south here at, at this point. Uh, and I got to go through my notes here, get down, catch up with myself. Uh, we're going to head south. The development of the south was, oh, was uh, first due to its connections to Bozeman. The people coming out of Bozeman, heading toward Yellowstone Park, because Yellowstone Park was created in 1872. The early ex exploration groups in the 18, 1869-1870s, earlier than that, the mining groups that went through, all came through Bozeman, came up over Trail Creek Pass, dropped down into Paradise Valley, which they referred to as the Yellowstone Valley, and then south into Yellowstone Park. And the reason for that is it was really hard from here, from Livingston, where Livingston becomes is to get into Paradise Valley. Uh, in fact, it was almost choked off. And we're going to take a look at that here in just a second. But that early development was that connection to, uh, to Bozeman. We have homesteading. We're going to see that. The homesteaders were sending their stuff to Bozeman because as Bozeman being a big agricultural center, we're selling a lot of that to the mines in Virginia City and Bannock. So here's another 1871 William Henry Jackson photo. This is uh, taken off Holiday Hill, which is the big hill just south of the uh, Carter's Bridge. And it's looking out across the valley. You can see the Yellowstone River, very obvious here. And this is the Spring Creek, the Pew Spring Creek down in here, the headwaters of it that's flowing. So looking in, an early look down into uh, the valley, totally undeveloped. Well, not totally undeveloped. There's a few homesteads, but pretty much undeveloped at this point. This is an incredible picture. Another one by F.J. Haynes taken in 1883. And this shows you why uh, there was a bottleneck trying to get into the Paradise Valley. This actually is not the Yellowstone River. This is Spring Creek. This is Tupu Spring Creek. Back over here is the Yellowstone River. I'm going to switch over here, back over here, and it flows on off this way. 
but this hillside, and they've already taken part of it out. This is the road bed for the railroad coming in. This hill came right down to the creek, and there was really, as you can see, no way to get past it. They're working on it here. And uh, interesting enough, they blasted through here is what they did, took a lot of dynamite. They talk about waiting for dynamite. There was Napoleon Ebert, the Ebert Apartments across from the library named after him. And they had the house on the old Clyde Park Road on Ferry Creek, the big Ebert mansion that sits out there today. But Napoleon Ebert was in the construction business as well as a rancher. But this was the bottleneck. Of course, Livingston didn't exist till the railroad got here, but people at Benson's Landing, early on Fort Parker, a lot of times if they wanted to go to Paradise Valley, they went back up over the pass and came back up over Trail Creek. It was easier than trying to get around this big mountainside that comes down in here. So this is a really good example of uh, what happened when the railroad got here and it's gonna really open things up. Uh, at this point, of course, Livingston starts getting built, but things explode. That's pretty amazing. This is a really doctored hand tinted photograph, we believe. But you can see the railroad down here and it goes through on the lower side. This is Holiday Hill. And look how that just comes right down along up to the river. So they've cut all this out. Ebert has blasted through. And then this is the road, the wagon road that they put up over, still really steep road to get down in there. This is actually Spring Creek. The Yellowstone River is over on this side over here. Once this opens up, <clears throat> there had been homesteading. We're going to talk a little bit about that. Paradise Valley just explodes with homesteading because now you have an easy way to get in and out. You don't have to go all the way over Trail Creek to Bozeman. Now you can bring your goods out to Livingston or you can put them on the train at Immigrant. Uh, so you have access now to national and international markets just that quick in a year. Uh, so things really start happening fast. That's also a major turning point for Yellowstone National Park. As you think about it, now people can come from overseas, a lot of the people who are doing the world tour from New York, they come across America, they can come all the way down here, take the train down to Cinnabar, we'll talk about that and take a tour into Yellowstone National Park. So it really opens up access to people. Prior to that, it was really hard to get to Yellowstone National Park. You came from really way far away. So the coming of the railroad is just incredible in the development of the South End here. So this is the, uh, Interesting, this is, I have 1864 on here. This is when Ben Strickland uh, set up his homestead. This is a later, you can see the train here, which came in 1883. This is a uh, illustration out of Leeson's History of Montana in the late 1880s when he put this book together. So they were showing off how, how uh, wealthy and how productive the Paradise Valley was. There was a railroad and so forth. But Ben Strickland was one of the early ones in 1864. And this is looking not really good picture. This would be Immigrant Gulch back up in here. Uh, they didn't do too good on this. But at the bottom of the gulch, the mining, we'll talk more about that. The mi Early on, there was mining up in here. Uh, claims were being, were being uh, filed. And down just low, if you go out, take the, the Chico Road, the Chico Cemetery Road to Old Chico, there's a big pond out there that was a, a pond used by a dredge. Close by was a Yellowstone City, one of the earliest cities per se in uh, Park County. It lasted only a year. It was gone in 1865 uh, because of the fact on the opposite side of the Yellowstone River, this was the Crow Indian Reservation. So they weren't supposed to be over there. And the Crows intimidated them. They didn't kill them, didn't burn them down, but just intimidated them. And finally, the people left. Ben Strickland had been there moved across the river, did his homestead, and uh, eventually would uh, become a major player in there. And early on, he was growing wheat and made a lot of money selling wheat into Bozeman. Of course, in 1864, up until 1883, they were taking that across Trail Creek Pass. <clears throat> Another early homestead, the Butler Ranch. And once again, this uh, illustration taken later, this is looking over at Immigrant Peak. Uh, but they were there in 1867, one of the early ones down there. Um, their uh, second home, which they built in 1905, is still down there about five miles south of Immigrant. If you're driving toward Yellowstone, 
on the right hand side of the road heading toward Yellowstone. There's a place, there's some big rocks out on the road and it says Wiki Up Bed and Breakfast. If you look back in there, there's a beautiful old Victorian home. That was the Butler's house built in 1905 there. Their uh, original big house burned down, uh, but still have their presence there. But once again, Lisa was showing off how, uh, how well to do the, the uh, homesteads were. Of course, they were promoting homesteaders at that time as well. <clears throat> this is a picture of the Bottler Ranch uh, before they, they built and actually before the guys got married. These are a couple of the brothers and friends, probably taken by William Henry Jackson in 1871. And the Bottlers uh, did a lot of guiding into the park. They guided a lot of the government tours. They guided the, the Hayden surveys uh, in 1871 that came through the park, which included the photographer. Notice all the pelts. These guys were hide hunters. These were all pelts from all kinds of animals. They were well known for that. That's how they made their living, guiding uh, and so forth. So that's an early, really early look at one of the early uh, establishments. And they would have been out there all by themselves, Strickland and, and uh, there. This is uh, Fridley's Ranch. He came a little bit later, 1885 after the railroad. Once again, you're looking at an immigrant peak over here, but a really well laid out homestead here. So Paradise Valley is, is now growing very quickly. Once again, 1883, the railroad opens up and a lot more people. And I'm just pointing out these three. Like I said, we could do a whole program on any one of these, one of these issues here. But uh, the Fridley Ranch what residence actually ended up as a train stop and it would become immigrant. And this is an early picture, probably the 1890s of immigrant Montana. Uh, actually it says 1890s, that's most it's probably around 1900, closer to that. So Fridley became immigrant, immigrant still there today. See the Yellowstone River. And then this is early irrigation being done. They're already digging irrigation and starting to irrigate. <clears throat> so things are doing really good. So Park County was very, very prosperous. Uh, good agriculture country. Uh, and we're gonna head a little bit further south now. We'll talk a little bit more. This is Yankee Jim Canyon. This is an FJ Haynes photograph taken either on that 1883 trip or maybe in 1882, he was out both of those years. Uh, but this was the road, Yankee Jim's toll road, actually started by Mr. Henderson to begin with through here. And this gives you an idea of going through that canyon, uh, pretty rough going through there. And this would all change in just a matter of years, in just a matter of about a year with the railroad. This is uh, very close to where that other picture was taken. So once the railroad got through and then they moved the road, if you go down, you can walk the old Yankee Jim Toll Road. It goes up over the top up here. But uh, once again, just that development and the opening up of the county. And I threw this in, this is Yankee Jim's cabin. This is where he, he, uh, he operated a toll gate before the railroad got here. So he paid a toll because he maintained the road through the canyon. So he charged a toll. And when the railroad came, they just went right on through. They, uh, they did put up some money to help realign the road and redo what was to become the Yellowstone Trail and be the wagon road through because you couldn't go down on the railroad tracks and kind of just cut Yankee Jim off, but that's his cabin. And uh, this is right across the river from the Yankee Jim, I believe it's Yankee Jim uh, fishing access on the Yellowstone, right as you come out of the canyon. You're looking down towards Cinnabar at this point. <clears throat> this is Cinnabar, this was Henderson's ranch. And this is where the railroad would uh, terminate for the park from 1883 to 1903. And this was his ranch, it gets built up. Uh, the railroad goes through, you can see a road down here, the railroad goes through down here. And it gets hotels and so forth. So you would come here and then you'd get off and take the stagecoaches and hire guides to go into Yellowstone National Park from here. The reason they stopped here for 20 years is they had an issue with a gentleman by the name of Buckskin Jim Cutler who had a mining claim between here and Gardner Gardner's only about three miles away, right down in here, these old photos, you don't get much of a background. But he had a mining claim that laid across and he wouldn't sell. He didn't like the railroad and he refused to sell. 
And uh, in 1903, it was finally settled out. I think he died shortly after that. And then they immediately pushed the train through to Gardner, Montana. But for 20 years, Cinnabar was the terminus and it's all gone today. There's nothing there today at all. No buildings or anything. Just And it, like Benson's Landing, just virtually disappeared overnight. Once the train went to Gardner, everybody moved their businesses to Gardner. And this is an 1896 photo of the train uh, coming out of Cinnabar heading toward Livingston. And now you can see a little bit better gardeners just over the hill back down in here going in. And I like to point out here, this, this track going off here, this is a huge, what they call a Y, W-Y-E. It would go way up here and then come swing way back down on the other side of these buildings. And that's how they turn trains around. Little railroad thing, there's three ways you can turn a train around, at least an engine, is either on a Y, so, or a circle, or a roundhouse. Those are the three ways you turn a train around. What a Y is, these guys would come in here to Cinnabar and they'd be facing the opposite direction. So they, didn't, they weren't gonna back up all the way to Livingston. So they back back down here and then switch and drive off on this Y. And then they'd back down the other side of it and then come out and it would face them the right direction. So uh, railroads require a lot of room. Gardner got around that by just putting a big circle in at Gardner, Montana. So now we're gonna go north and I'm gonna um, jump to my notes here again. And, uh, we'll take a look at this, Cinnabar, looking for it. So the development of the Shields Valley uh, comes a little bit later, uh, actually the 1880s, the mid to late 1880s. And um, that's because it was really hard to get up in there. The roads weren't very good. There was the Castle Mountain Road, which was part of the old Clyde Park Road. And then the very Creek Road up over the top. Uh, homesteaders start showing up there in the uh, in the mid 1880s. This is Will Sal uh, looking east toward the Crazy Mountains. This is shortly after the railroad arrived in 1910. So Will Sal was already established. They were already uh, had quite an agriculture going on in the valley out there. And you drive up through the Shields River Valley. It's a beautiful area, beautiful agricultural area. And Will Sal. Uh, I can't think of their last names, but it's named after two young people who were really early homesteaders there. Uh, first names, William and Sally. So that's how Will Sal got its name, William and Sally. But once the train got there, things started exploding. And also the, there, there were some issues going on here with the weather. Things were, they were doing really good, 1910, 1880s. I'm gonna go a little bit further. This is Clyde Park, <coughs> uh, looking out toward the Crazy Mountains up by, up by Brackett Creek looking down. And once again, it, it uh, sprang up and really got going once the railroad got there. And St. Paul, this is Diane. We had a question uh, about a few slides back and it's about Cinnabar. Uh -huh. the question, yeah, the question is why is there nothing left at Cinnabar? Did the NPS or, or anyone else intentionally remove the structures? This person has walked through the site and you'd almost never know there was a town there. Yeah, NP, uh, you know, it was a ranch. It was Henderson's ranch. And why he didn't ranch there afterwards, I'm not sure. What what happened is NPR didn't move anything, but the businesses that had sprang up, WA Hall, the big WA Hall store that used to be there in Gardner, he got his start at Cinnabar. There was the Cinnabar Hotel and other amenities there. As soon as the train pushed through to Gardner, they picked up their businesses and just left. So either they moved buildings or tore their buildings down to reuse them for construction in Gardner. But once again, just almost overnight, it just disappeared because there was no reason for anything to be there other than the ranch. Henderson, I believe by that time, it probably moved on. So uh, it just reverted back. But uh, it's just one of those things that happened because of the railroad. Great, thanks. Hope that answered the question. Okay, so uh, the Shields River. The Shields River was really known for its agricultural, agriculture, <clears throat> huge agriculture. And that's why they really started moving into the area in the 1880s and a lot of farming. This is an early 1900s photograph. 
uh, wheat farming was really big up there. You don't see much wheat farming in that area today. What had, ha what had been happening was in the 1800s up until 1919, Montana was in the middle of a really wet period. Uh, this area was receiving about 20 inches of rain a year. We get about 10 inches these days. So you could do what's called dry land farming. And dry land farming is you don't irrigate, you just rely on the amount of rainfall you get. And look at this crop here. You can see this, how high this is up around this guy's probably pulling a thresher here. They're cutting, cutting wheat here and shocking it up. But just this was with no irrigation, just with rainfall. And as any of you who know agriculture today in this area, you couldn't get away with that today. We just don't get that much rainfall. But it was a really, really wet period. <clears throat> and then by the mid 1900s, uh, 1914, the war comes on, the government starts buying all the wheat they can buy, things explode, um, people start expanding. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. We're gonna look, here's another photograph of um, a wheat harvest out in the, uh, the Shields Valley. But they're gonna run into some problems. And this is an interesting photograph. We just had, th this photograph's been in the collection for quite a while. Uh, this was a steam tractor uh, run by the uh, uh, Bridgman and Nash were the two. And that's Mr. Bridgman standing on the tractor. And they had been back, it says it was one at a crop expedition held in Minneapolis. Minneapolis would hold these big crop uh, expeditions um, not expeditions, I got that wrong, exhibits. And Shields Valley that year in 1912 walked away with something like nine out of 12 awards for the amount of grain, the amount largest yield per acre and the most nutritious grain. Bridgman and Nash, who had been working together, uh, won uh, the gold prize. They got this tractor, they won this big, huge tractor and $5,000, incredible amount of money in 1912 they immediately started buying more property. <clears throat> they only used this tractor for a short while. It wasn't uh, the area, I should say, Shields Valley isn't conducted for a tractor like this. All the little side hills and little areas as you saw in those other pictures. This tractor is made for the Great Plains, big, huge, flat open areas. So they only had it for a few years, then they sold the tractor. But they expanded like a lot of other um, uh, like a lot of other uh, agricultural farmers in the area. Expansion wise meaning they bought more property, they invested in tractors. Technology is now starting to come along. Uh, you start seeing in the early 1900s, more tractors showing up. So this tractor is pulling a whole bunch of equipment here that previous to this, you'd have to take each piece of equipment by itself with horses. Now one tractor could pull the whole thing. So what happens is people overextend themselves because they're, they're borrowing money from the banks to buy property, to buy tractors, uh, to build houses and so forth. And um, other things are going on. We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Here's uh, sheep became very, very uh, big industry, not only in the North End in uh, the Shields Valley, but also here Livingston and South, the Harvets, we're familiar with the Harvets Flats. Uh, and then uh, sheep was big. This might be part of the Goat Mountain Ranch, uh, sheep from Goat Mountain. Goat Mountain Ranch was originally owned by Jay Hill, who was the man who built the Great Northern Railroad. Later, he purchased the Northern Pacific Railroad, owned both of them. And that ranch was there for quite a while, later ran by his son, Walter Hill, who was a well-known eccentric around Livingston in his, his early years here. But this is just a little look at sheep. So sheep was a big industry. The Harvards had about 30,000, 20 or 30,000 head of sheep that they were running in the county at the south end. The Goat, Man, Goat Mountain Ranch, probably about the same amount of sheep. So it was big business in those days. Um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna digress up this next, I like this next one. This is, uh, Clyde Park. I just like this photo, furniture and undertaking. We take care of you. You need a nice comfortable couch, we can do it. You need a nice comfortable coffin, we can do that too. I just I just love the, uh, the entrepreneurship of this. 
of this going on in Clyde Park. But let's get back on track here. This is a very interesting piece of, of propaganda. And I came across this years and years ago, actually when I was down in Nevada before I came to Montana. And uh, at the time I didn't understand it. I've learned a lot more about what happened with the, the uh, homesteading. This is the Milwaukee Road and they came across the Southern part of Montana. You can see here, Levina, Harleton, this is Three Forks. And they did a big push for, uh, for homesteaders to come in because they got all this property from the government for building this railroad. So they needed people to come in so that they could, they could uh, uh, have product to move. But what I like about this, see this guy is plowing here. He's plowing up gold coins. And all you gotta do is just plow, boy, the gold will just roll out of the ground for you. It's, this is just incredible country. Now remember 1912, this is the year that Shields Valley was winning awards all over uh, what they called the Northwest, which was Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, considered the Northwest, was booming with agriculture because of those wet years. So they pushed this. This is also part of a bogus uh, science thing that said, if you plow, the rain will come. Or if you plant trees, it'll rain more. And so uh, don't just leave the, the, you know, the area out there. If you start plowing, you'll get more rain. It'll be better for everybody, uh, which turns out not to be true. That's not how it works. But it brought out thousands and thousands of homesteaders. Now, after, um, after 1919, the war is over. The government's no longer buying wheat. And the drought hits overnight. In 1917, 1918, they're pulling in uh, 30 to 39 bushels per acre. In 1919, they're pulling in five bushels per acre because the rain just stopped. Things started drying up. And what had happened is people had overextended themselves. They bought property away from the rivers. Remember, there, was no, there, there wasn't a lot of irrigation. There was some irrigation going on. But if you weren't on water or if you didn't have an irrigation, you were out of business. I mean, just flat out of business. Between 1920 and 1930, one half of all homesteads in the Northwest, and that's, like I said, Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, Oregon, and Washington, one half of the homesteads failed between 1920 and 1930, one under. All that property that they had, that they had bought all went back to the banks, you know, all their machinery and everything. Uh, it was just a huge failure. And our weather has been pretty much like that since. We don't consider it drought, it's just kind of normal. But uh, it was just those wet years and then promotions like this uh, went on. It also led to a lot of problems why people hated the railroads because they blamed the railroads for getting them to come out. But in Park County in 1932, they still, uh, they still like what's going on. They're still pushing their agriculture. Of course, this is toward the end of the, uh, the depression. So they're saying, I like this here. Keep, keep your money at home. Don't be going to Bozeman, buy it here in Livingston. But showing you their crops here, a million dollars worth of agriculture, $175,000 worth of, of uh, sheep and cattle and so forth going on. So agriculture has played a big part in, in the valley, in the development of of agriculture. Now we're gonna jump, like I said, we're gonna jump around a little. We're gonna talk about the railroad. The railroad once again changed everything. Uh, it created the wealth that built Livingston. It created the infrastructure for the, the expansion of the homesteading. Uh, which later suffered, but still, you know, created once again, giving them open to that markets, being able to get out there. This is an early photograph of the shops at Livingston, probably somewhere around 1884, maybe 1885. I estimate from uh, newspaper articles and so forth, probably 600 to 800 workers are working at uh, the railroad, at, for the railroad at this point in Livingston. Now that's everybody, that's not just the shops. That's the, the ticket takers, the, the, the engineers, the conductors, the brakemen, 
the telegraph people, all of that, all the, all that taken together. And also at this time, there would have been hundreds of guys on construction crews. Remember I mentioned when they finished the railroad, they threw that railroad down to get it in so they could get it finished and get the money from the government. Then they had to go back and rebuild it. Now, I remember I said they were only managing to get up to about 25 miles an hour for a few years. Well, they have huge crews out there basically just building the railroad again, going back in and fixing up the, the ballast, putting in new ties, setting the rails up, straightening them up, putting in better bridges. They had a lot of problems with bridges collapsing because they would just throw them up to get with. So a lot of those workers, uh, 600, 800 workers, a lot of them would have been big construction crews at that point. But in 1884, in the uh, Livingston Enterprise, the Northern Pacific Railroad says that within the next year, they will have 1,000 jobs in Livingston. So the railroad just really, uh, really made Livingston what it is. This is a little bit later. Like I said, we're going to jump around. This is 1912. And what they're doing is they're adding more stalls, big stalls on. This is where they pulled the trains in to rebuild. Livingston was set up from the very beginning as rebuilt shops for the railroad. That's because it's about halfway between Minneapolis, St. Paul and Tacoma, Washington. So it was very convenient for them to bring trains here instead of having to send them either end. This is the big roundhouse back in here. So these were rebuild shops. They weren't building brand new engines. They were rebuilding steam engines. You got to rebuild them every couple of years because the water calcifies up, ruins the inside of the boilers and so forth. But they're expanding, and you can see the size of their shops in here, and the big Tesla grain elevator right back here. Uh, I found these numbers in the newspaper. It's really interesting. This picture is taken probably about 19, uh, 1915. You can see they finished their, their new shops here. But in 1891, their payroll was $65,000 a month. In today's money, that works out to about $1,800,000 every month coming into the community. That's people buying houses, that's people you know, paying rent, buying cars, sending their kids to school, buying groceries, buying clothes, all of that. By 1912, it was up to $90,000 a month. Today, about 200, a little over $2,300,000 a month, every single month coming into the community. Livingston was very well-to-do. That's why other than Clark City, you don't see Livingston as being that ramshackle uh, tents and, and, and shacks that you see in Western development towns, which were mining because of the money that was coming into this community from the railroads. From the very beginning, they start building with brick. Uh, by 1890, there's five brickyards in the valley providing bricks for building here. This is the second depot built in uh, late 1888. And like I said, they'd moved it across, but this shows uh, the first depot was wood. This shows some of that money. This is a brick building, really pretty, really pretty building up there. St. Paul, we yes. have another question. Um, in the picture of the railroad shops from 1884, it looks like the hills behind are almost entirely devoid of trees. And was deforestation uh, lumber industry around town a big issue with the arrival of the railroad? Oh, yeah, there might have been. Not really so much. I'm sure, you know, like anything, any, any lumber that was close by is going to go. You mm -hmm. know, there was no mining or anything at that point. But... Uh, and then probably over the years with development, just people were a little bit more, it wasn't a big lumber industry here. There, there was a lumber uh, mill industry, uh, Gonauer, who, you know, was Ninth Street Island was Gonauer Island. He had a big lumber mill down at uh, Cinnabar by Cinnabar. And then early on, Tomlinson in the 1860s actually had a lumber mill up Mill Creek. That's how Mill Creek got its name from his lumber mill. And he was, he was floating wood down to Benson's Landing and people heading back east from the mines out of Virginia City would come through Bozeman, come over to Benson's Landing. They would build flat bottom boats and float down the Yellowstone River. So, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure uh, about that completely, why they look a little bit more denuded than they are. Hmm. Okay, thanks. The other thing is you can see the roundhouse here, which they began construction in 1883 immediately. Once again, they knew they were going to be here. So a lot of money coming into town because of the railroads. There's their new depot. 
there's our depot today, the third depot built in 1902. They moved it back across the tracks, as you can see, eliminated that problem of people wandering back and forth across the tracks. But <clears throat> this depot says something as well. It's a statement by the railroad on how important Livingston was and also the connection to Yellowstone National Park. You didn't need a depot like this for Livingston, Montana. They're showing off. They're, this is first class. These were the railroads were the big giant corporations of the day. And so they built this big, beautiful depot that we still have here today in Livingston. Here's an interior shot of the uh, of the main rebuild shops. Now, this was just where they worked on the, the big engines. They had a wheel shop. You see wheels down here, but they would have been came in from a different building. So they had all the trades here. There were boiler makers, there were wheelwrights, there were tinsmiths, there were plumbers, there were painters, there was electricians. All of that was represented here. And eventually those were union jobs. And uh, so once again, those union jobs, as you saw in that payment, were very good bringing in the money. Um, so that the, uh, the shop here, they could turn out seven engines a month. They'd rebuild seven engines. And that's what they're doing here. They're basically just rebuilding the boilers because the boilers get burned out, the pipes get all calcified, they have to be replaced. The fire brick all gets burned out. You have to replace all that. So this is the interior of the main rebuild shops. Um, show you kind of how big the, the industry here. Here's another one of it. I like this photo. There's a guy sitting up on top of this engine here. Give you an idea how big that was, and what was going on in the shops. Okay, here's a steam engine getting ready for a rebuild. They've already torn a lot of the fire brick out. They're gonna pull the front end off and start pulling the piping out. And so later down the road when they finished it, this is what it looked like when they finished, when they came out of the shops. So uh, an incredible amount of work was going on here. I'm gonna have to move along. This is a uh, early roundhouse. It started in 1883. There were uh, 21 stalls. Later, that they increased this up to, a, I think, close to uh, 50 stalls. They keep doing. So this is the round table here. It's called a roundhouse. This is how you turn engines around. Remember, I said the three ways. You'd bring an engine up on this and then just literally turn it around. It would spin around it. Then it could go the other way. They would back them in here. This was for minor maintenance. The big shops were when they were tearing these things down and rebuilding them. Let's say you know it had a leak somewhere or, or it just needed minor maintenance. They would do that minor maintenance in the in the roundhouse in these shops. The, the roundhouse employed about 110 people. Almost forgot. By the 1920s, Livingston's population a little over 5,000, somewhere between 1,600 and 1,700 people worked for the railroad. Now a population of 5,000. That's not 5,000 working men. That's 5,000 men, women, and children. So a huge portion of the population of Livingston made their living with the railroad. Just, I, I push that on people because railroads had a, played a big part in things, but here in Livingston, it is exactly why um, Livingston developed the way it did because of these railroad shops. Dangerous. Some engineer was having a bad day this year. Took his engine into the pit. This is the round, this is the table on the roundhouse. Uh, railroading in the late 1800s, early 1900s was a very, very dangerous occupation in America. One of the programs I saw here a few years ago, uh, between 1869, the first transcontinental railroad in 1920, somewhere like 110,000 people were killed on the railroad. Workers were killed on the railroad. Really, really dangerous if you don't know what you're doing and not watching how much you're doing. This is a later photo taken in 47. They're adding on more shops here. You can see construction going on. And now you can see that huge roundhouse back here in the expansion. They're still expanding in the 1940s. This is the 1950s. That expansion has been completed. This is Front Street down here now. Um, oh, actually, I think it's Calton Street. But I, I wanted to throw this picture in. Not only does it show the extent of the shops, this area right in here, these, this housing, this was a Japanese encampment. And Jay Hill, who built the Great Northern later uh, bought the Northern Pacific Railroad, thought the Japanese made the best workers in the world. 
And he actually puts out orders that if any Japanese show up, hire him because they were really good workers here in Livingston. I don't know if he did this elsewhere. They actually provided housing. Now, a lot of this was dormitory. These were single men working for the railroad. They have a big garden here. Jerry Brecky, park historian, tells me a story, a, a guy he knew in the late 1920s when this gentleman was a young boy, he and his mother would go over here to buy vegetables in the middle of winter. The railroad was producing so much energy, so much steam, they piped steam over to heat these buildings. Japanese workers were doing hydroponic gardening. The Japanese story, as well as the Chinese story in Livingston is something that really needs to be researched and looked at. But uh, this existed up until, well, this is 50. This would have been abandoned by this point, probably because during World War II, all the Japanese were moved to internment camps and that brought about that end. But it was here uh, probably from about 1910 on, we had this Japanese camp. And then this picture taken in 2010 shows you the footprint of the railroad property, this big arc in the buildings that dominated the town. Here's downtown Livingston High School and so forth. Gotta move along here and get talking too much. Any questions out there, anybody? I'm gonna take a drink of water. Hot Springs, I talked about Hunter's Hot Springs, 1870, it was being developed. By the late 1800s, they built this two-story hotel. The stagecoach here would have been your connection over to Springdale about two miles away. Springdale came up as a little agricultural center, but also the railroad had a stop there for Hunter's Hot Springs. Uh, people were coming uh, from all over the country for hot springs. And at this time, uh, what we get is uh, the movement of sanitariums. Now, 1909, they went big here at Hunter's Hot Springs. This is the uh, the Dakota Hotel, existed until 1932. This is the swimming area down here, a big swimming pool. This is the hotel. These were a part of a big movement of sanitariums, uh, hot spring areas out west for the treatment of tuberculosis. Uh, go out west because the air is drier, it's not as wet. Tuberculosis, of course, is a lung disease. Uh, and so you came out in hot springs, were known for that for soaking. And a lot of this was long-term. This wasn't just vacation. People would come and they would spend weeks. They would spend months, you know, regaining their, their health at these places. Uh, Hunter's Hot Springs also used their, uh, uh, for recreation as well. They had a golf course out there and you could go fishing on the Yellowstone River, but they were really big, became really big because of the tuberculosis and sanatoriums is what they call them. By the 1930s, they start dying off. In the 1940s, they come up with the antibiotics to deal with tuberculosis and it all goes away. Here's a close up view of the Dakota. For those of you who are into architecture, this is Spanish revival, the late 1800s. Montana went through this huge Spanish revival and you find Spanish revival architecture all over Montana. There's another picture of Hunter's Hot Springs. The hot springs comes right down through these trees. All that's left is some brickwork down in here. All of this is gone. That shows you how big it was that was going on. A major player in the county. Chico Hot Springs. <clears throat> this is the original hotel and pool. This is the pool back here where it still is today, but original. First hotel in 1888 built in there. And then it, eventually it was purchased and became a hospital and it was a sanatorium, just like Hunter's Hot Springs. People would come here to take the waters and for their health and, and so forth, but also for recreational use as well. Here's a later picture, it's been completely rebuilt. You got a new building here. These are the hotels that are there today. The pool cover, tents back up here, then the barns. They're actually, by this time, they were almost a dude ranch. They were running horseback rides and so forth. So you can see kind of the way out of Chico. And here's some of the girls out having fun. Uh, great bathing suits, love those bathing suits. The girls have there, probably maids from the hotel. Leduc Hot Springs, little known hot spring area. It's down between Corwin Springs and Gardner. Uh, today, all that's there is two big wellheads right along the road, right about in here. 
but the Leducs had a hotel there and ran a hot spring. I love this bridge. Wouldn't that have been something to go across on a windy winter day, crossing the Yellowstone River? But the other thing Leduc provided for was they provided water for Corwin Springs, which is two miles to the north. And this was their big hotel, uh, built once again a sanatorium. This is a nicer photograph of it. Uh, this is the swimming pool called a Victorium. It's over here than the big hotel restaurant from across the river. They got their water from Leduc Hot Springs. They piped it down the two miles from Leduc to uh, Corwin Springs. This is a picture. This is where the bridge is today because the, the old road, the Yellowstone Trail Road and Road to Yellowstone went in on this side of the river. Later, 89 comes through. This hotel burnt down in 1916. But today in this area right in here, there's the new Yellowstone Hot Springs Resort. I don't know if anybody's been down there. I heard it's pretty nice. I think they were kind of closed up this last year. They got opened about two years ago and they are using water from Corwin Hot Springs. That's those big two wellheads now. They will provide the hot water for the hot springs down here. The hot springs were a, a, a major part of the early economy of the town. Yellowstone National Park. Once again, we could do a whole, uh, you know, a whole thing on Yellowstone National Park. Its impact on Park County was great, not only recreation-wise, but economy with the, uh, the business, people who are doing business with the park and so forth. Of course, the Gardner Gateway, uh, the Gardner Arch, built in 1903-04 for the opening of the railroad. The railroad got there in 03, really started operating full-time in 04 at Gardner. Uh, here's the, a train. This is a siding. Specifically, the siding's not there anymore. This is specifically for the Yellowstone Park. This sign back here says Yellowstone Park train. So they'd bring a train in here. And during the seasonal time, there'd be their, they'd, they'd be running their trains down to, uh, down to Gardner on a daily basis. And then later in the off season, not so much tourism. This is a tally ho coach at Gardner heading out. And these are great, these coaches. You see all the people sitting up on top up here. These coaches were only used between Cinnabar and Gardner and Mammoth. They were not used inside the park. Uh, they were built just specifically these six horse teams. But uh, big business. Here's another picture of the, the new depot uh, designed and built by Robert Reamer, who did Old Faithful Inn. He also did the arch that we saw. And so uh, a lot of tourist business going into the park. And our connection here. There were a lot of camping companies in the park. Uh, the, uh, there, were, there were large and small camping companies, two of the largest ones, the Sean Powell and Wiley Way. Wiley Way was out of Bozeman. Sean Powell was located here in Livingston. And these were focused on kind of the middle class travelers. The rich people were driving, arriving by railroads and staying in the hotels. The, uh, these guys had what they call permanent camps in the park, which became the lodges. If you go throughout Yellowstone, there's lodges. That's uh, what the camps were about. But Sean Powell did a lot of business and they were located here, here, here in Livingston. Okay, we're gonna get the mining. I don't know if there's any questions out there, but uh, mining is a whole nother story. And I kind of saved this for last, although mining starts everything. In the West, almost all development comes from mining. Uh, agriculture is early on, but a lot of mining is what sprang up in towns. The same here in Park County, the early development. I mentioned that 1864, Yellowstone City, the mining up Immigrant Gulch. Uh, here's Cook City, which was gold mines. And there was a great, hopefully you guys, uh, some of you people caught the program last week. Kelly Hartman from Cook City has written a wonderful book on Cook City and it's attempt to get the railroad to come up there. They had these mines, but they couldn't really use them much because there was no way to get the the, uh, the material out. You know, they, they really had no easy way to, to haul their ore out to get it. There was really, there was a mill built here later, but uh, not much. And like a lot of the, the gold mines and so forth in uh, Park, uh, Park County, they lasted a while, but then they played out. This is Jardine up above Gardner, 1925, toward the end of its days and it's gonna play out. The mines weren't huge. Of course, today, they, the gold mine, it's a whole different thing. Coke, Cokedale, excuse me. Coal, probably did more coal mining, brought in more money in Park County than, than gold mining. 
but this is in between uh, Livingston and Bozeman Pass. If you go out, you take the frontage road, then you go out to Cokedale. These are the coking ovens. Down in here, there was about 110 of them. So they, this is a big mine coming in. There's a big mine back up in here. All of this is gone. Uh, the bottom part of the coke ovens are there, but the town of Cokedale is almost completely gone. There's a couple of ranches out there. Uh, coking, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, it, took me a while to figure out what coking was all about. Coal at it itself doesn't burn well. So they made these ovens and they would burn the coal and it turns into coke under certain conditions. Coke burns hotter and longer than coal. So coke is really what was being shipped, not so much the coal. Uh, this is Aldridge, one of the largest coal mining areas here in Park County. Uh, you can see the big tailings from their coal mines. They were doing underground mining here. And then this is located, this hill here, right on the, the other side of this hill, if you were to go, whoops, what did I do there? Uh, I gotta get back. Sorry about that. Let me click the wrong place now. I don't know if I can move here. I think I'm gonna... Oh, I'm gonna have to go back. Excuse me. Share. Okay, there we go. Now, hopefully, I can. Yep, okay. Sorry about that. I uh, excuse me. Big figures. Anyway, on the back side of this hill is Devil's Slide, the big geological feature you see when you drive into the park, give you an idea where, where Aldridge is. Uh, a lot of coal came out of here. Also, another interesting thing about Aldridge, the first buttery store in Montana was in Aldridge, Montana. Uh, buttery had been uh, working with A.W. Miles at Hoffman, which is up on Trail Creek Road, and then he moved to Aldridge and opened up his first store. And when the mines kind of played out, he moved to Great Falls and became the buttery store that we used to have. This is uh, electric. It was originally called Horror, changed to electric in 1904. The story is, is the women didn't like the name Horror. And these are the coking ovens right along the railroad. So they had access once again to that railroad, once the railroad came. So mining in, uh, in Park County uh, was there, but it wasn't really big. The, the, the coal mining pretty much disappears after about 1910. The reason for that is the big mines at Coal Strip are being opened. Uh, there was labor problems and they weren't big. Uh, Aldridge was one of the bigger of the mines. They were small mines, so they really couldn't compete against huge big mines that were being developed out at, uh, out at Coal Strip. So the coal mining goes away. So mining played a part of the development, but not so much as, as the, the agriculture and so forth. But we're getting down to the end here. I wanted to end up here. So if you get your questions ready, there was one mining claim that paid off in the long run. If you look at mining claim maps like Cook City, the whole area is just covered with claims. And a mining claim is uh, 300 feet wide by 600 feet long, big rectangles. Guys that just claim whole mountainsides and have all kinds of claims. Uh, I don't know how many there are. I don't know if Kelly talked on that last week, but there must be a hundred claims up there. You look at mining claims at Immigrant Gulch, the whole gulch from Old Chico up is just all mining claims. Most of them are gone. Most of them are still held by people, but they're not being worked. Uh, there's no money to be made at it on a small basis like, uh, today. But there was one mining claim that paid off in the long run. It started paying when it was first claimed in the 1880s. And I bet today they took money out of this mining claim today. And I don't know if any of you can uh, come up and think what this might be. You might be surprised. Chico Hot Springs. <laughs> Chico Hot Springs is a mining claim. It was not a homestead. It was not taken as a ranch. It was a mining claim. They mined for only a short period of time and then immediately built the hotel and started using the hot springs. So it's been a hospital, a sanatorium, hot spring spa, a dude ranch. And today it is still mining those tourist dollars here in Park County. So from the very beginning in 1870 with Hunter's Hot Springs to today, the hot springs have kind of uh, bookended our economies there on, on, on their work. But I, I got a kick out of this when I found out that Chico Hot Springs is actually a mining claim. So hopefully I didn't bore you all to death. 
that was really kind of a brief overview looking at some of that. Like I said, any one of those mining, agriculture, or the towns, we could do a whole program on. But uh, I enjoy presenting and uh, thank you very much for being with us this evening. And hopefully, maybe there's some questions. I don't know. Remember, everybody, thanks. First of all, Paul, thanks so much. Um, you covered a lot of area geographically, you know, the, the ways that Park County has been successful and is and people have settled I mean what a what a tour the last hour or so has been and we really appreciate it I want to remind everybody that if you do have questions just type them into the Q&A at the bottom of your screen there and um, we've got a little bit of time to take a few more questions if there are more for those of you who um, are really familiar with the landscape I think one of the great things about your program is that is that we could see, we could actually imagine uh, those buildings that are gone or those, the railroad, the structures, because there's enough uh, topography to, to really see where the, the places are that those pictures were, were taken. So it's been really fascinating. Looks like we got another question and that is where exactly is Hunter Hot Springs and is it privately owned now? Okay, Hunter's Hot, Hunter's Hot Springs is located on the convict grade road. If you go north up 89 toward Clyde Park, you cross the Yellowstone River if you go out the freeway. And then after you cross the river just a little bit, there's the convict grade road to your right. That road follows the Yellowstone River all the way back over to Springdale. When you get just a couple miles from Springdale, you'll come across the hot springs. Now there's nothing there today, as I mentioned, there's just a little bit of foundation left of the parking, the parking wall and so forth. Uh, so everything has gone out of there, although I'm not sure, Karen, I think you worked out there for a while or you had some connection. I know the Japanese were going to do hydroponics out there at one point that didn't work out. And then Randy Taylor, for, former county commissioner, told me when he was a kid in the 50s, they would go out there and swim. So there was still a, a pool there, probably not that big pool we saw at the Dakota, but mm -hmm. uh, was being used. But anyway, it's about two miles from, uh, uh, from Springdale two miles toward Livingston from Springdale. It, it's hard to say exactly where it is. If you get there, you'll see the, what's left of the, uh, you know, of the rock work along the wall there and where the, the hot springs cross the road. It's all privately owned. My understanding is they're still, they've been fighting water rights since the 1880s on Hunter's Hot Springs. And now there's a huge house up at the top end of Hunter's Hot Springs. Some uh, Texas uh -huh. oil guy built a huge house up there. I think there's still arm wrestling over water rights out there. But uh, if you look closely when you get out there, what'll, what'll set it off is you're driving along and you'll see the trees where the creek, uh, Hot Spring Creek flows and the road crosses it. There was that one picture looking down the long way. That's about the best I can describe. That's great. Actually, we have another question here from someone who's uh, in the process of building a home uh, near Mill Creek and, and Route 89, and they wanted to know um, the origin of the name of Mill Creek. They might have missed that earlier when you talked about it. Mill Creek got its name because there was a lumber mill up there in the 1860s. Uh, the Tomlinsons were up there. Mr. Tomlinson, I can't think of his first name. He had a mill there and he was milling wood and then they were floating that wood down the Yellowstone River to Benson's Landing, which is about three miles east of us out where Cavalry Cemetery is. And then they would build flatboats for the miners returning back east to float. So Mill Creek gets its name from the lumber mill that Tomlinson had up on Mill Creek. Great, thanks. I have a question for you, Paul. Sure. Um, I also, another name question, I wondered who Leduc and also Corwin Hot Springs, who they were named for. Do you happen to know that? Corwin, I'm not sure. I'd have to look into that. The Ladukes are still here. The Ladukes still live here. In fact, there was a, Kerry Leduc uh, was on our board of directors and a volunteer when I first got here. His family uh, goes back and they own that at one time. Uh, it was bought out, probably became part of the, the, what was it, the Royal Teton Ranch, you know, before the, before the church bought it all because the church owns the water rights on, on, on Leduc Hot Springs. So I think that at some point they sold that property, you know, and then it became part of the Royal Teton Ranch and now it's owned by the church. And they're the ones who did that new uh, Yellowstone Hot Spring development there at Corwin Springs. Corwin, I'd have to look, I'm sorry, I don't know where that name came from. 
I've got another um, couple of questions here. Um, someone asks two questions. The first is, one, they thought that the Wiley Company had a footprint in not Bozeman, but Livingston at one point, and maybe even Second Street. Does that ring any bells? No, well, by the way, it was pretty much Bozeman. Uh, Sean Powell was, was the ones over here at Livingston. Now, I'm not, I shouldn't say that they didn't. They may have had an office here, but the Wileys were out of Bozeman is kind of where they, where they ran from. Uh, okay. I should quote that. I don't know for sure. But Shaw and Powell were centered here in Livingston. And when they do that bus tour in the summer, they point out the house that Shaw's owned, you know, the big house down there, I think on Clark Street. And okay. had a big footprint here. And then uh, actually on 5th Street, there's a house 220 5th Street South or 120 South right across from the church. Edward Mormon, who worked for the uh, Wiley Way Camp, well, the Sean Powell Camping Company, well, no, Wiley Way, I guess it was, for 50 years built a house that, that house is here. That's just wow. a side thing. But if Wiley Way had something over here, it might have been just an office. Or they okay. might have been picking you up at the railroad. But, they had another uh, question but, oh, too. Oh, go ahead. Oh, sure. So the the second question is, and the person says, if they're not badly misquoting him, and they hope not, they thought that Warren McGee thought that the Japanese area during the war years might have served also as a local smaller internment camp. Any possible truth to that? Uh, it may be. That's like I said, a, a lot of research needs to be done. Mm -hmm. On that, the only thing there is a family in uh, Belgrade that I lost track of whose parents, the, and these were older people, their parents were moved out of this camp here to Heart Mountain down by Cody. Right. I'm not saying that's not, it might have been used because of the essential workers, railroad workers. Mm -hmm. Once again, there's a lot of research missing on the Japanese and the Chinese uh, here in, in Livingston. And it's quite possibly that some of them may have lived there during the war. Yeah, that would be fascinating. Another question, um, someone's asking about the rail line between Livingston and Yellowstone Park and they wanna know if the line is still there. Well, the line is still there, it's been abandoned and, and when railroads abandon a line, there's a couple of different ways they can do it. Uh, I learned all this when I was in West Yellowstone working with the over there. Uh, you can abandon uh, I forget what it legally. Anyway, the north route that goes up through the Shields River, part of that is still owned by the railroad. Part of it reverted individually to property owners. The Yellowstone line from Livingston to Yellowstone National Park was what's called a complete abandonment. So all property reverted to the property owners, that the property they crossed. So even though you drive out there and you can see the old rail bed, all that is all privately owned. So that's a real damper of course, we have the old Yellowstone Trail you can use for bicycles. But talking about rails and trails, that's a real damper because all that property. And then when you get down, just before you go into Yankee Jim Canyon, there's some really big houses on the right there. They're built right across the railroad right away. They're sitting right on it. So that's what happened south of us. North of us, there's still some sections that could probably be worked on. Uh, rails to trails because it was abandoned a little bit differently. It just, it's a legal thing that the railroads use for abandonment. But I do know mm -hmm. that uh, from my research and hearing from people who are in the know that uh, the Yellowstone route was completely abandoned. So that's all private property these days. Great. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Turn it over to Karen. Yeah, last chance. Stop the historian. <laughs> well, Paul, thank you so much for such a wonderful program this evening. Um, and while we would all like to do these programs in person, I think that it's, it's really been great because our reach has expanded. There are a lot of people living um, or watching tonight who not normally will be able to come to a program in Livingston. So. Thank you to the audience and also thank you to Paul. Uh, I will be uploading this program to YouTube just as soon as possible within the next day. So thanks again and hope to see you at our program um, May 13th um, on Thursday night. And until then, have a nice evening and all right. be well. My pleasure. Thank you all for participating. Thanks. Bye-bye. Thank you.
Bye. Bye.